So, we basically have completed four weeks of the course now and uh, I want to quickly summarize what we learnt in the first four weeks uh, so that um, you have a chance to uh, in one single place to see quite diverse material, right? We have seen very many different concepts that have been introduced. So, hopefully this bunch of slides will put all of these concepts and things together in one place and easy for you to refer to later on, okay? So, what did we learn? We learnt basically that the economics, the world of economics is organized using producers or firms, consumers and exchange, right? So, this is circular diagram that Suresh Babu presented, which basically is, uh, uh, so which basically contains households on one side, firms on the other side, firms sell goods and services to households and households basically provide the land, labor and capital to the firms. And you see that therefore, resources are moving in this direction like this, while the money that is paid for acquiring these resources moves in the opposite direction. So, you buy goods and services, the household returns back money which goes to the firms, that is how the firms earn the money. The firms in return basically take land, labor and capital. So, for land they have to pay some rent, for capital they have to pay maybe dividend, maybe interest depending on whether it is whether it's taken as a debt or it is taken as a share capital or whatever it is. And for labor they have to pay salaries, right, wages. So, rent, wages, interest, profit all that goes back from the firms to the households. So, this flow of money on one direction and goods on the other direction, this circular flow basically has to be managed very well and you say the economy is well managed if basically this flow is happening without any bottlenecks. So, that is what we learned first thing. Second, we learned basically that households happen to be the unit of consumption. We do not look at individuals, we look at households as the unit of consumption. The households consume goods and services, the firms produce those goods and services. So, therefore, there is a close correlation between the two. So, you could study household consumption and you can get a good idea of its impact on firms. So, household consumption data is a great indicator of how well firms are going to do or are doing, okay. So, where do you get this consumption data, right? So, it turns out basically that this consumption data can come from many sources. One is that you can do a primary survey. In fact, we in this for the purpose of this course, we showed you that we actually did a primary survey with three different households at different levels of income. One was at 15,000 a month, another was at 30,000 a month, another was 50,000 a month. So, how do you get consumption data from primary surveys and then use those primary survey data to make some sense like of whether or not some consumption patterns are changing with income or within the consumption basket, what are the possible variations that you can have? Like somebody owns a house, somebody does not own a house, so he has to pay rent, things like this, okay? Do they own a vehicle, which means some different consumption patterns? Do they eat out or do they make food at home? This kind of thing. Whether they are young and old, if they are young, maybe they eat out more, if they are old, maybe they cook at home, we do not know, these kind of things, okay? So, we saw that basically this household consumption patterns, it varies with income, it varies with demographics and it also varies with time. So, there is seasonality. So, we saw also that basically, you know, people buy during festival time, they buy a lot. In fact, they may even borrow and buy and so on. So, this is, there is a seasonality like that and there is a long term because of income effects and so on. For a long term, people start to change their consumption patterns. Initially, maybe they spend more money on food. Later on, they buy more, uh, you know, consumer goods and so on they may be buying. Like, you know, refrigerators, air conditioners, cars and things like that they may start buying later on. Okay. So, the primary sources we saw were primary survey, the NSSO data which is low frequency, but it is very extensive and it is universal. Then the CMIE data which is this consumer household pyramid survey, data which is high frequency, it is targeted. More importantly, it is what we saw was it is longitudinal because it tells you for one household how the household has moved along, right, in time. And um, <clears throat> then you can see some specific uh, consulting agencies give us some interesting insights into how the consumption patterns are changing. They capture different aspects like for example, that the female is, the women are making decisions more than men today. People are using other means to get information about the products they buy like electronics, media and all that is making a big difference in that. And you get different slices of the data set also through this method, okay. Um, then we saw basically that there are some very fundamental concepts underlying the economic model of the world, right? 
and one of them is utility which is about customer satisfaction how do you measure satisfaction using this concept called utility and utility we saw basically sometimes can be measured which is cardinal or cannot be measured it can only be ranked which means it's ordinal and then we saw that there is this concept of a total utility and a marginal utility so a consumption of one additional item can be different from the consumption of the first item right so if you have 10 items already the 11th item the utility you get from that might be very little especially for example food but sometimes you are saturated you don't want to eat anymore right so there is a diminishing marginal utility and we saw basically that the customer essentially maximizes utility by choosing for a given income they choose the different goods or services that give you the best utility right so you change your consumption inside your consumption pattern you change the goods and services in such a way that the total goods and services you are consuming gives you the maximum utility given your budget that is what the customer does and uh, if you put this consumption of individual customers together you get this concept called demand and this demand total demand can be captured using what is called the demand schedule which is a table which tells you how much demand is there at different price points or you can draw that plot it in the form of a graph so you can either have a graph or a table and uh, this graph basically the demand graph you can see how things basically change how these things change with for example price right so when you change price when you increase the price the demand reduces when you reduce the price maybe the demand increases we have seen this all the time right when com customer when companies give discounts suddenly during festivals especially suddenly the demand increases because people are waiting for that kind of a discount to be given so demand varies with price and this basically is represented by movement along the demand curve on the other hand there could be non price factors that change the demand curve and in this case the demand curve itself shifts to the left or right for example the demand curve we saw basically can change with income so a normal good the demand curve basically increases with higher income but an inferior good is one where the demand decreases because it's an inferior good for the name is name inferior basically means that when income increases people drop the inferior good and go to another good a normal good okay so they are buying it because they can't afford it but once they start able to afford they'll drop the inferior good and move to a normal good so that is why this is an inferior good similarly if the price of one item leads to an increase in demand of the other it's called a substitute if the price of one item decreases the demand of another it's called a complement okay and we saw also basically that the other non price factors are taste you know expectation because if you think that your income is going to be increasing quite a lot if you expect for example there is pay commissions and so on government employees get or bonus is going to come next month if you if you think that you are going to get an income you might go and consume something now in expectation of this income that comes in the future thereby also maybe taking some credit on your credit card things demand also can change with number of buyers if a lot of people buy something you may also go buy something because you want to be part to see in part of a group or a set or something like that you want to be an in group so this herd mentality as it's called okay that can also play equilibrium price is the price at which market clearing price it's called the price at which the demand and supply are matched right that is called equilibrium price then we see basically that demand can change in a way which is called elastic demand okay which means that the quantity demand responds substantially to changes in price so luxury goods for example are elastic things which are with have close substitutes are more considered more elastic then there are demands which are inelastic which means that thing quantity does not change so essential for example if you have a medicine you need a medicine you need the medicine now price of the medicine you you don't look at whether or not it cost 50 rupees or 100 rupees if that medicine is going to make a difference between whether you live or die isn't it so essential goods necessities are inelastic if you are very very hungry you need food and you will be willing to pay a little bit more and get the food because if there is no other choice that's what you will do right then there is this idea of cross price elasticity of demand which means uh, substitutes basically shows positive cross price elasticity and complements show negative cross price elasticity means the demand of one causes a negative change in the price of the other right so that is what negative cross price elasticity means so negative income elasticity we saw already is for inferior goods so we saw that idea of demand and the change in demand right and this concept of elasticity so that is on one side the other side you have this idea of production so when you do production again you can look at production costs so what are the costs and then we saw that costs can be either accounting costs or economic costs so when you do economic way of 
calculating cost, you actually incorporate into the thing also opportunity cost. So, you could have used the money to do something else. So, you use that. So, you look at whether or not the money has been deployed correctly. So, that way of doing thing is called opportunity cost. And we saw that there is this idea of economic profit and accounting profit, right. So, they are different, right, as was explained by Suresh Babu. Cost itself come in various kinds, right. You have fixed cost, you have variable cost. Fixed cost is plant and machinery. Variable cost is like people, labor, materials and so on, a variable cost, which can change. As your revenue changes, you can change your variable cost, but you cannot change your fixed cost because you already sunk it. You have made a factory, it is there, okay. Uh, so, then there are, so using those things, you can calculate the total average and marginal costs and then you can draw the cost curves and then you can determine from the cost curves what is the optimum production quantity and you can use the short term and long term cost curves to try and figure out what is the way to modularize or to basically stage your capacity addition. You start with a smaller capacity in the beginning, then you expand your capacity as your demand builds up and so on. So, this kind of strategies you can use by looking at these long and short term curves, cost curves. There is this thing called production function which we saw basically relates input to output and using the production function you can basically talk about a marginal and an average product, right. And then basically using that you have this idea of increasing constant and diminishing returns to scale. Basically it means that the, from the inputs you can keep making more and more output for some time that is called increasing return to scale. And then you will find that after some time there is, it, you are not getting you are getting a constant return to scale. Adding some more input is not changing that much the output, okay. That is called constant. And after some time, the input, adding an input basically may even cause the return to reduce. So, for example, we all know that when we have more people, people will talk with each other and so actually your productivity can reduce. That is an example of a diminishing return to scale, right. So, you can have increasing constant or diminishing return to scale. Ideally, you like to operate in the increasing return to scale or maybe at the constant return to scale definitely not in the diminishing return to scale area. So, that tells you your operating point, optimal operating point and also tells you how to manage your capacity correctly and so on, okay. We also saw that in a competitive market where price cannot be controlled, only quantity can be optimized, how do you set the quantity correctly. Finally, we looked at pricing decisions, what kind of pricing we can use, we can use various strategies like market skimming, value pricing, loss leader pricing, psychological pricing. You can do tender pricing, we can do penetration pricing, all this kind of cost plus pricing and so on. Very different strategies depending on the circumstance. The same firm might use actually at some time cost plus pricing or for some products cost plus pricing and some other products they may be doing market skimming, okay. So, depending on what value you are delivering to your customers, you can decide on your pricing strategy. Then we said let us take a firm's financial statements, profit and loss balance sheet cash flow statements. And let us try and analyze some ratios, right. So, the ratios can be in terms of how well they are managing their cash, how well they are managing their operations, are they generating profitability or not, are they returning to shareholders sufficiently. So, earnings per share, price earning ratio, these are all methods of testing whether or not they are returning properly to shareholders. Are they able to meet their debt obligations? So, they have borrowed money from someone, they have to return, give interest back. Do they have enough money to give interest back or will they suddenly become insolvent as it is called? Or, so, liquidity measures that. So, we saw that current ratio and quick ratio tell you whether or not they can meet debt obligations, right, obligations to debtors. Then there is this idea of whether they are managing their inventory very well. So, this inventory stock turnover or are they collecting money from their customers very well, which is managed, which is measured using what is called debtor days. Then we looked at four firms, Ultratech, Page Industries, Nestle and TCS. We saw basically that Ultratech is a capital intensive industry with low profit margin and low ROC. Mainly material energy costs dominate their cost structure. They are able to control their price, but it is an industry which is cartelized in a way. They set prices very carefully and the price also keeps increasing steadily year over year per bag. And so, they have control over the price and, but they do not have much control over the volume. And uh, the volume is the one that is going to basically determine whether the company basically uh, you know, uses its capacity well enough or not. And so, capacity addition decisions are all determined by volume growth. Page Industries is a much slightly different industry, comes from textile sector. So, here the ROC is higher compared to Ultratech, which is cement, because they do not have much capital assets. Their main costs are employment costs and raw material costs, and uh, they have low debt, they have a good cash flow. 
Then we saw FMCG which is uh, example here is Nestle. We saw that differentiation is very key in FMCG company. So, these companies also operate with very low debt, very very high ROC, 100 plus percent ROC. They are dividend paying companies because they are not growing. There is no need to add capacity. They are not growing that fast, at least near term. Long term, it looks very good, but in the near term, Nestle, they are not growing that much. So, basically, they just return most of the cash they are generating using as dividends to their shareholders. Uh, very highly dependent on consumption patterns. Clearly, it is FMCG, so it should be dependent on consumption patterns. Then we saw TCS, an IT company. Their only cost is employment, mainly that is the only cost they have. Very, very high profit margin, very high ROC, generates a hell of a lot of cash. So, very good business, okay, in some sense. All right. So, there are four firms. Then we moved on from there to analyzing the industry. Then we saw basically that there are various methods of classification like labor, material, ownership, etc. And there is this NIC codes that have been given to industry. There are many sources from which you can get data about industries. The annual survey of industries uses factory data. The factory inspector goes and collects information from the factories. It is infrequent, but it is reliable source of data. Then there is this thing called industry Indus, index of industrial production, which is available monthly. So, it is a high frequency data and it is quite valuable data to figure out what is going on in the industry. Then there is this sentiment, which is kind of a futuristic kind of a measure, purchasing managers index PMI, which basically if the score of PMI score is above 50. So, there are 5 things and each of them is rated on a scale of 10, 10 being normal. If it is above 50, which means each of them have 10 or more, then basically it means that it is positive. If it is less than 50, it is 45 or something, it means the trend is negative. So, so some kind of sentiment score where you are asking questions about whether or not a firm is going to invest, is going to buy, whether it is going to do anything new, right. Then we saw basically that you can find out more about the market structure using concentration ratios, which is basically a market share information you are using. And then Harfindahl index, which is some kind of a square of the market share and then doing something, using that you create an index. Using this, you can classify the industry into whether it is perfectly competitive, whether it is somewhat not so perfectly competitive, what is called mono, monopolistic competition, where there is one firm which is trying to set the price and everybody else is a price taker. There is a price leader and a price taker. Then few companies cartel and they manage the industry, like in the case of uh, cement and all that. Or you could have uh, a single company that dominates, right, and does everything. Like in the case of utilities, many utilities are in this form, monopolies. Then we saw basically that Porter's five forces which are basically about competition within a sector, whether your suppliers are bargaining with you too much, customers are bargaining with you too much. So, one, two, three forces and then are there new entrants who are coming in? That is the fourth threat and then the are there substitutes for your product? That is the fifth. So, these five forces basically how they impact a firm and so using this you can try and figure out whether the firm is well positioned or even whether the industry itself is well positioned, you can figure out by using Porter's five forces. So, we analyzed four industries, cement industry, FMCG industry. We did not use Porter's five forces per se here, but some factors in the Porter's five forces that were relevant were highlighted. Like for example, we saw in the cement industry, they are currently trying to add capacity. Ultra tech is trying to increase its market share by putting more disproportionately more capacity up, right. FMCG for example, there is a trend, somewhat weak trend, weakness trend is seen in the FMCG industry in the near term. But in the long term, it looks very, very good because India still as a consumption per capita consumption, India is very, very low. So, they, and we saw that raw material costs is increasing right now because commodity prices are going up and this is going to create profit compression on the FMCG industry. This is an example of Porter's five forces being used to analyze the industry, right. Similarly, in the textile industry, we saw that it is an industry which has a mix of domestic and exports, both of which have potential. We saw that the textile industry in India is not competitive in finished products but it's competitive in cotton products and yarn. The IT industry is got a cost advantage, which is going to keep driving the industry, but also at the same time, they're looking at value addition through what is called digital transformation. So, partly value addition, partly cost advantage, two drivers, which will keep this industry growing for at least 10 years, if not more. So, Indian companies are still at a very low share of market from a world perspective and so have a very good potential to grow. This is a summary of our analysis of these four industries. 
and we expect basically that you will also do similar analysis of the industry that we give you in the assignment. So, the assignment basically will be giving you a firm and we expect basically you will take the financial data of this firm from money control, we will tell you where to look and you will basically take looking at the financial data and other data that is surrounding analyst reports and so on, you will prepare a report which tells you about the sales, the profitability, the trends and its competitive position and what is happening in the industry and what is happening to this company with respect to the industry, right. And you will have to make a report and this will be your assignment for this four weeks. So, with that I think we come to an end of the first four weeks. We look forward to seeing you again after this in the fifth week where we will be introducing you the first case study which is FabMart.